Oh, good morning, everyone. We are happy to have all of you here. I'm glad to see you all. And since we don't have so much time, I will start immediately with introducing our guests. So here to my left, we have uh, Bernie Sanders. He is a United States Senator from Vermont. A seat he has held since 2007, and he's the longest serving independent in US congressional history. As we all know, he campaigned for the Democratic Party nomination for being president of the United States in 2016 and 2020. And as Senator Sanders is a self-described democratic socialist, I would say he is the leader of the progressive movement in the United States. Welcome Senator Sanders to the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Also, I'm happy to introduce Carla Remzma. Carla Remzma is a climate activist from Berlin, and she is one of the founders of the Greta Thunberg-inspired uh, school strike for climate here in Germany. Here we call it Fridays for Future. Carla courageously represents the goals of her movement in the media, and she does not shy away from confrontations with government representatives. Welcome, Carla. I have the honor to moderate this conversation. My name is Stefan Liebig. As of March, I will be heading the New York office of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, which is responsible for United Nations, United States, and Canada. And for the last 12 years, I have been a member of the German Bundestag. We invited Senator Sanders to talk about the perspective of democratic, perspectives of democratic socialism and the multiracial working class movement today for about 15 minutes. But Senator, um, before you start, um, as you know, our hearts and our thoughts are with the people in Middle East right now. They are about to suffer another terrible war. And you have been very clear in your positions in the last days. And I would be happy if you could share a few thoughts about that here for us. Thank you. And, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I think what we are witnessing now is not only a heartbreaking tragedy uh, in terms of Hamas's terrorist attack and the murdering of Israelis and the thousands and thousands of people on both sides uh, who are dying and my very great fears of what happens in the next days and weeks. Um, what Hamas did is unspeakable, but what I do not want to see in a territory of Gaza which has about two million desperate people, it's very poor, uh, half of whom are children. And what we don't want to see is a slaughter of children in response. Uh, so it is a difficult situation. Um, what Hamas, uh, all over the world that I know in Germany, and certainly in the United States, and even in Israel, uh, and I've met with those people, there was an understanding that, that the Israeli occupation uh, of Gaza was a disaster. I mean, uh, before this uh, event, uh, unemployment among young people in Gaza was 73%. 73%, which means that if you're a young person in Gaza, you have no life. And that was then, uh, and all over the world, and in Israel, there were very brave people who said, this, is, this occupation is wrong. You ought to give people in Gaza a decent standard of living, decent hope for the future. And all of that is gone now. All of that effort to bring justice to the Palestinian people is gone. Peace in the region is gone. And what this terrible attack has done, I think, is given aid and comfort to the extremists on both sides. So if you're a right-wing Israeli, Netanyahu, or even further to the right, your response is, we told you, you can never trust the Palestinians, they never want peace, and the only response is military. And then if you are a supporter of Hamas, what you say, you see, we did it. We didn't win the war, we can't win yet, but we did incur real pain 
to the Israelis. We should be very happy about that. We could do more. And that's where we are. So it is horrible. It is going to set back peace in the region, innocent children, women going to die. So I, I wish I had something better to say, but it is just a horror show. Thank you for sharing uh, your thoughts about this. Before I give you the floor, um, I will just tell you what will happen in the next uh, few minutes. So after the speech um, by Senator Sanders, I will talk to Carla a little bit, and then we have a little conversation. And I have to tell you in advance so that nobody is disappointed, there will be another appointment for Senator Sanders very soon, so we don't have time for Q&A later. Senator Sanders, uh, the floor is yours for your speech. Well, thank you very much. And Thank you for everybody being here. And Carla, thank you. Um, I wish I had some magical solutions in my pocket to the crises that we face. I don't. Um, but what I can tell you, I believe to be true in the United States and Germany and throughout the world, I, I think the best that we can do for a start is simply tell the truth, which does not always happen in politics. And by that I mean recognize the reality of what is going on on people's lives. And we don't, we don't do that often. So obviously I am much more familiar with the United States than uh, Europe and the rest of the world. But I will tell you what's going on in the United States. It's important you understand that because the United States is the largest economy in the world, uh, the strongest military in the world. And what happens in the United States often has a ripple effect uh, in Europe and around the world. Uh, in America right now, uh, we are seeing rapid movement toward oligarchy. Does that term resonate? People know what I mean by oligarchy. What oligarchy means is you have fewer and fewer very wealthy people who have growing economic and political power. Now that is the reality, but that's a reality we don't talk about very much in America because the oligarchy does not want us to talk about it but it is a truth. In my view, uh, people want to understand the impacts of society on their lives. Why is their life the way it is? You're a young person. What are the forces that are shaping your lives and your friends, you're older? What are the forces that are shaping your lives? We don't discuss that very much. And if people don't have an explanation or an understanding of what's going on, then you can have demagogues scapegoating people and giving false explanations as to what's going on. All your problems. You're having a problem with your wife? Well, it's the immigrants. You have a problem at the job? It's gay people. Uh, you know, and on and on. You scapegoat people and you let the population believe that that is the cause of your problem. So it's very important, I think, that we do our best to explain in, in easily understood language what we believe the crises are. All right? So in my country, we have a situation where in the last 50 or 60 years, there has been a massive transfer of wealth. That expression, OK, again, I. I apologize, sometimes I use American vernacular and I don't know if it translates. But a massive transfer of wealth from working class in America to the top 1%. We're talking about trillions of dollars. Today in America, the weekly income of the average American worker is lower, lower than it was 50 years ago. Do you all get that? That is an extraordinary statement. After 50 years of increased technology, computers, cell phones, robotics, the internet, all of the changes, the average worker is worse off today, economically. When I was a kid growing up, and my wife Jane grew up near me in Brooklyn, New York, what the situation was, and I come from a working class family, we didn't have any money. But even in those days, one person in those days, mostly the men, could work 40 hours a week and support the family. Do you all understanding what I'm saying here? 
Today, there are very few working class families in America where one person can pay the bills. 60, six zero percent of workers in America live paycheck to paycheck. That means you go to work, you work hard, and at the end of the week, you have nothing. You gotta go to work. And there are studies out there that if for that working class family, let's say your car breaks down and you need to spend $500 to get it fixed, a huge percentage of families would be in financial despair to come up with that $500. They don't have it. Now, this is an issue we don't talk about in America. Not talked about. Why not? Because you got a media which is controlled by these billionaires. And these are issues they would rather not discuss. And anyhow, while the middle class is struggling, and while we have in America some 600,000 people who are homeless, the people on top are doing phenomenally well. The richest people in America, and I expect the world, have never, ever done better. What we are seeing in America are three people, and this to me, and, and I'm one of the few people in America who talks about it because people, politicians are not comfortable about talking about it. Three people, led by Mr. Musk, own more wealth than the bottom half of American society. 160 million people. Three people, 160 million people. In America, we have, unlike Germany and much of Europe, a healthcare system which is a total disaster. People can't afford to go to the doctor. In America, if young people go to college, it will cost them, depending on the school they go to, 30, 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars a year. Many of them come out deeply in debt. In America, like Germany, we have a major housing crisis, which means not just uh, that we have homelessness, but millions of people spending half of their income to put a roof over their head. And meanwhile, since COVID around the world, and I gotta say this over and over and over again, since COVID, last three years, the world has created about $42 trillion in wealth all over the world. Two thirds of that have gone to the 1%. Two thirds of all new wealth created in recent years have gone to the 1%. Now we don't talk about it. The 1% would prefer us not to talk about it. But what we need to do, I think most importantly, and I'm aware of the politics now taking place in Europe, and certainly I'm aware of it in the United States, is we need to do some hard thinking of how we come up, how we explain to people, to working people, lower income people, the forces that in fact are shaping their lives. And if we don't do that, then there will be a, what we call a false narrative. It will be immigrants or gay people, whoever it may be, who will be the scapegoats. So we have a lot of work in front of us. And then on top of that, on top of the massive level of income and wealth inequality and oligarchy, we have the issues that young people are dealing with, and that is the crisis of climate. And I don't have to tell anybody who went through this last summer in Europe, in the United States, in China, what is happening to the planet. And the difficulty there is that Germany alone is not gonna solve this crisis, nor will the United States. We need cooperation from China, from India, from Russia. How do you bring the world together to address it at a time when there is more and more stress between, say, the United States and China? China is now the major carbon emitter uh, in, in the world. So those are, I have no magical, the other thing that I would throw out is, and I think maybe we discuss it more in the United States than in Europe, I don't know is the revolution taking place in the workplace in terms of robotics and information, uh, artificial intelligence. And that is going to, the jobs that you have today are not going to be there 10 or 20 years ago. Who's making those decisions? Are the people at the top are saying, hey, I can replace all of you with robots, good luck. Or do we use that artificial intelligence 
and technology to improve life for working people. Who makes those decisions? What happens? And in the United States, what we are trying to do, some of us, is to deliberately push that issue and say, if we're going to have a revolution in the workplace, I want workers to benefit from it and not just the corporations who own the technology. And that means in my country, legally, the work week in America established, if you can believe it, back in 1940, before the war, was 40 hours a week. It is still 40 hours a week. So we are trying now, and I will bring forth legislation to lower that work week to 32 hours with workers maintaining the same pay. So the point is we want to make sure that ordinary people benefit from this sweeping revolutionary technology, not just the owner. So bottom line is the world is changing very rapidly. We have the threats of climate. You have information technology. You have massive income and wealth inequality. And as progressives, we are going to have to figure out how we communicate and how we organize and how we educate people all around us. Because if we do not, and it's my, true in my country and true in Europe, if we do not, other people will fill that vacuum with false narratives and lies, and their goal will be to divide us up in all kinds of ways. So we've got a lot of work to do, and I would hope that we can have better communication between Europe and the United States uh, as we go forward addressing those issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Sanders. Um, you mentioned the climate change and you, Clara, you are working uh, for the future of our planet. Sometimes there are people on the left who would accuse uh, climate activists that they are not caring enough about economic issues. But you are fighting not only for a real federal climate change act, but also for living wages. Why do you think the critique of capitalism and climate protection belong together? Well, I think when we talk about capitalism, about social economic issues and the climate crisis, we have to look back at what is the cause of both things. And that is indeed capitalism. Because capitalism exploits people as well as natural resources and our planet and is the leading cause of why we are right now at the state we're in, where people are facing extreme weather events, where people are fleeing their countries, where they don't have a roof above their heads anymore because of these events which are happening and which are about to get worse and worse in the future. And it's not only capitalism is the cause and we see those drastic consequences um, as a, um, in case of the climate crisis, but it also hits hardest the people who are already marginalized, who already face poverty, who are not getting uh, good wages, who are um, working under bad conditions, who are working in agriculture, who are um, in uh, countries in the southern, um, not southern Europe, southern hemisphere, um, and in the global south. And so we see that there's this really big intersection between capitalism and climate and social economic issues and the climate crisis as well. But it's not only on the side of the causes, but also when we address climate change or the climate crisis and the solutions, we always have to think about how do the solutions we propose and we want to put in place affect the people who are already the most marginalized in our societies? We mustn't put forward solutions who are, which are expensive and go on costs of the people who are already facing existential threats due to rising cost of living, for example. We, I will make an example from coming from Germany here, but I think you can relate this to the US American experience as well. We have just seen a really high rise of the right-wing populist AFD, not only in Eastern German countries, um, but also in the recent elections just a week ago um, in Bavaria and Hessen. And where did they gain their votes from? It wasn't because of the fear of immigration, um, which was uh, talked about a lot, but actually if you look at the polls, it happened 
like six months ago when there was this heating law proposed in Germany, talking about the heating transition, about getting heat pumps um, installed in most of the homes to get away from fossil heating. And right-wing parties, but also conservatives and liberals really talked about this, oh, it's so expensive. There's no social security for this. We cannot afford this. And suddenly there was this idea really on top of every headline in the news, um, on top of the minds of everybody in the public debate, that climate protection is expensive and that climate protection is a way, um, will create social dissent for a lot of people. And the fear of social dis dissent is something which we see which really fuels fear and which really fuels that people go to and vote right for right-wing populist parties, that they um, don't want to have to do anything with politics anymore, that they're of course afraid of climate protection and say, oh, we mustn't do anything against this, this is just something for the upper class, for the elite, for the Vogue people. Um, and I think this is where we really have to find solutions which bring this two together. We cannot only talk about climate protection as a single issue, but it runs through all the sectors we have in our society. It's about heating, it's about transport, it's about the houses we live in, it's about our jobs, because let's face it, some jobs will not exist in a green future. Some people will not work in the fossil fuel industry anymore, for example. But finding a way to our greener future mustn't come at cost of those people, but we need to find solutions bringing together this, bringing together the people who are affected by the climate crisis as well as by capitalist exploitation. And I think this is where the ideas of what had happened in the US with proposing a Green New Deal as an answer, bringing together social as well as climate issues is something where we really need to work on instead of separating us and saying, oh, we cannot do climate if we're on the left because climate is just something for the rich people, because it isn't. In the end, everybody is affected by the climate crisis and the poorest people are those who are hit hardest when you don't work an office job, but you work maybe in construction, you work in agriculture, you are hit the hardest by extreme weather events. People who don't ha cannot afford a high rent, they live at the most polluted streets and areas. Um, and this is where we need to come together and I think find solutions and this is why we cannot tackle the climate crisis without talking about capitalism, but we can also not talk about a social future without talking about climate crisis. Thank you so much, Carla. And you are also committed to other topics, uh, whether it is a uh, Seebrücke, it's a sea bridge which uh, rescues people fleeing war, terror, and poverty from Europe from drowning in the Mediterranean, or the initiative DV and Co. Enteignen, which is not understandable for Senator Sanders, <laughs> which aims to socialize large real estate companies in Berlin because of the high rents. What are your motivations to do this? I think on the one end side, it's really important that we as progressive people are not seeing ourselves as a single issue or committed to just a single issue because, as I just explained, there is so much interconnection between these different issues. And whilst it's quite often not possible to have, unless you're maybe a party, for example, like a solution for all these topics, it's still important to speak out about them because then it is clear that there is this connection that, for example, when we talk about the housing, um, the energy transition, the heating transition will affect rents. Flats have to got, get renovated. And if we have a lot of like private ownership, often the landlords will increase the rents on cost of the people renting there. And they will see, oh yes, the energy transition is a threat for me having a decent living. And that mustn't be the case. So I think coming together there is really, really important. And it also makes it possible to give an idea of what this buzzword of just transition or social ecological transition, which is, I think, quite often a buzzword where we don't really yet know where it's going and where a lot of people say, oh, but what do you mean by that? Um, that's impossible. What, how do we make it concrete? What are the concrete steps? And I think these initiatives you already talked about are initiatives which make clear, oh, yes, there are solutions which are all part, there's not one solution for the dress transition, but they are all part, they're like puzzle pieces coming together. I think we have this one really interesting initiative coming from um, 
It's called Wir fahren zusammen, we're driving together. And it's coming on the one hand side from climate activists, and on the other hand side there are people organized by Verdi, the union, um, they're organizing bus drivers and the drivers of the tram and at the subway. And they are coming together calling for uh, investments into the public transport system. They are calling for affordable public transport system, um, for making it bigger, for having good wages for the people working there and better working condition. And I think this is a really good example that people who are often talked, oh, the climate activists, they are so elite and they have no idea of working with the working class, actually coming together and fighting for an issue which affects both groups and which is at the center of both groups and makes it really clear, oh yes, we actually have ideas of how the just transition can look like. Those are the green jobs. They're jobs of the future. We need public transport for having a climate friendly society and a way to move around. And coming there together, I think, really shows a way in how we can actually learn from the communities we're working in and take them as the baseline of how we move forward to actually getting that just transition, moving it from this buzzword to something in the concrete. With my unfortunately last question, I will bring back the conversation to the United States. Senator Sanders, in your book, you mention often President Franklin D. Roosevelt, his new deal as a model for the Democratic Party. And you say, I quote, quite unbelievably, Uber capitalism is willing to sacrifice the future of the planet for its short term profits. We cannot allow that to happen. This is uh, what Carla is fighting against. And uh, we could read in your book about uh, the one thing that you already mentioned, the Green New Deal introduced by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And that was one fight. And there was another fight uh, uh, in the beginning of the Biden administration that was a fight for Build Back Better. And in your book, um, one can read your disappointment how it turned out in the end. You mentioned this picture where you sit at the stairs. Uh, and maybe you can tell a little bit where this debate has gone, what, what was the devolo development, and how do you look in the future of these two things, Build Back Better, Green New Deal? Um, the Green New Deal, which um, Alexandria did a wonderful job uh, in the House with, and uh, I work with some senators in the Senate on, dealt with much of what Clara was talking about. And that is what we don't want the fight against climate to look like is upper income people concerned about their future. Uh, obviously it impacts everybody and the poorest the most. And the point that we were making is that yes, as you transform your energy system away from fossil fuel, jobs will be lost, that's true. But number one, we will protect those workers with making sure that their income continues, they get the job training they need, et cetera. We call that a just transition. But the second point to be made is that we will create far more jobs than we will lose as we transform our energy system. Uh, right now, uh, we are, I passed as part of another bill, I think it was $8 billion dollars that will make it possible for lower income and middle class people to install solar panels on their rooftop and it will result in a significant reduction in their electric bills. So when we talk about climate, I think Clara, this was your point, we want to talk about not only saving the planet, we want to talk about good jobs uh, being created uh, and lower utility bills. So. We make the argument that even if you don't care about climate change and I'm going to lower your electric bill, what do you think? You say, that's a good idea. Let's do it. And that's what we are trying to do. Now, let me give you a brief history of America under Biden and what we have tried to do. Uh, when Biden came into office, uh, we as you were experiencing the horrors of the COVID pandemic. And under Trump, obviously, we handled that, America handled that very, very poorly. Uh, 3,000 people a day were dying. 3,000 a day, hospitals were overrun with COVID. Patients, small businesses were going out of business, schools were closing down. 
it was really the worst moment, uh, at the very least, since the 1930s. And I was then chairman of the Budget Committee and worked with the President and others in developing what we call the American Rescue Plan, which turned out to be a $1.9 trillion bill, which even in America is a lot of money, uh, which essentially rebuilt, not rebuilt, but provided strong support to our healthcare system. It put money into the pockets of working people, $1,400 uh, for every man, woman, and child. It kept the schools open. We extended unemployment. We did what Europe has done for a long time. We have a very high childhood poverty level. We put $250 into every parent in America. We lowered the poverty, childhood poverty, by 40%. It was a huge bill. And Biden was very strongly supportive. Uh, I wanted it even bigger, but it was very consequential. That was perceived in America correctly as an emergency piece of legislation. How do you deal with COVID? How do you deal with the economic, major economic downturn? What do we do? And that's what we did. But what the president said, to his credit, you know, I ran against the president. He is not the world's most progressive guy. But he understood the moment. And he wanted to do something beyond the emergency legislation. So we have what we call long-term systemic and structural problems in healthcare, in education, in prescription drugs, in infrastructure, in housing, in home health care. We put together what started as a $6 trillion bill, which would have essentially transformed the entire social network of America. It would, by far, be the most radical piece of legislation since the 1930s, maybe even more so. We had zero Republican support. We got something done in the House. We lost in the Senate by two votes because we had what we call corporate Democrats who voted with the Republicans. They didn't support us. And that was a major blowback, major, major setback for addressing the needs of the working class uh, in America. So that's a, a brief history of that moment. One, one. That brings us to the end of our event. Senator Sanders has to leave because he has an interview with the daily newspaper Tats on the other side of the spree. Um, I would like to thank him and I would like to thank Carla Rensma very much for their time here at the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. And I wish you both all the best for our important fights. And I would like to thank you for the attention. Thank you. Thank you.